Welcome to Zen and the Art of Real Estate Investing. What if you could learn from experienced real estate investors, find out what got them to where they are now, get insight into their daily habits, and take these insights to inspire your own growth? Each week, Jonathan Green shares an in-depth look at the mindful approach to real estate investing. Jonathan is a real estate investor, advisor, and coach, as well as the founder of Streamlined Properties and the team leader of Streamlined Properties on Market, brokered by eXp Realty. Whether you are looking to start from scratch, get to the next level, or just a straightforward and honest approach to real estate investing, Jonathan seeks to provide a free mentorship program you can take with you anywhere. Now, here's Jonathan. Our guest today is my friend, Ryan Goldfarb. He is a partner in Liberty Hudson Capital, which is the culmination of years of work by Ryan and John Erico, who will be a future guest. They are experienced New York and New Jersey-based investors. And Ryan has recently gone bananas in Atlantic City, which we'll talk about, but he's invested all over New Jersey, Hudson, Bergen, Essex, and Atlanta counties, as well as New Haven, Connecticut, and some other areas. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. Excited yeah. to start the day with you here. Yeah, me too. Was the first time I met you at a Brick by Brick or did I meet you before that? I know I met you at one of your meetups. In before that. Union, in Union County, I think. Oh, and yeah. There might have been another time that we met before it. Before that. I don't I think we originally connected through Bigger Pockets. Yeah. Way back as, in the day when I was active on there. Yeah, as many of us have, Bigger Pockets has played the role of conduit for a lot of our relationships, but we're probably going on more than five years up by now. So I appreciate yeah. you getting on the show. We've obviously done a bunch of like webinar stuff and we've done a lot of deal dives together. So I'm happy to get you on here, talk about your experience. You haven't been in real estate your whole life, but when did you get started? I bought my first property in 2013. I was right around when I graduated college. It was a turnkey rental in Memphis, Tennessee. It was kind of my opportunity to get one under my belt in a pretty low risk way. So my brother and I went 50-50 on that. I ended up selling it a few years later. During that time, I was starting my first job in real estate finance, Wells Fargo, multifamily capital group. We did primarily Fannie Freddie debt on large multifamily real estate. So that was my foray into the more sophisticated side of real estate. While I was there, I started doing some flips on the side, started buying some rental property, and ultimately in 2016, jumped into real estate investing full time. Yeah, just slotting back for a sec, how did you decide on Memphis as your first investment? Because me knowing you well, know you're a data guy, especially from our self-storage plays. But how did you decide on that first property? Because I know a lot of new investors have trouble pulling the trigger and figuring out what areas they really want to go in. So how did you do it, you and your brother at that time? I would say it was a mix between a data-driven approach and subjective evaluation. I took a trip out there maybe six months prior to getting our first place under contract. And I had never been to Memphis before, so I, I really had no idea what to expect. And it was really an opportunity to see the different neighborhoods in the flesh and to understand how the different dynamics work with one another. There are companies like FedEx that have a big presence there. And that was certainly a driving force behind it. It seemed like it was a fairly resilient economy. And there were enough indicators of growth for me to buy into the thesis. And the reality was there weren't a whole lot of markets where we felt like we could buy something being fairly capital constrained for under fifty or seventy five thousand dollars that wasn't in a total war zone and that didn't need a full gut. So yeah. the fact that we were able to check those boxes kinda it, it left it in rarefied air. There were not there was not a whole lot of competition. So yeah, it was it was kinda I, I wish I could say it was as fully flat fledged a thesis as I would have nowadays, but at the time it definitely wasn't that developed. Yeah, but uh, so did you guys decide on something turnkey just to reduce the potential of disaster of CapEx and things from afar, especially you guys were pretty young then trying to figure out what to do? Yeah, I mean, we had no idea what we were doing. We had no no idea how to price out construction, no idea how to manage, no idea how to really do any aspect of, of the project. So it was definitely a way to hedge risk. I mean, the, the flip side of that was we knew it was never going to make us rich. We knew it was never going to really contribute any like meaningful dollars to the bottom line, but it was more so an experience play and an opportunity to get our first one under our belts. 
Yeah, I think that's a smart point. I think too many people are thinking that every, I mean, of course you want to build building blocks for your future, but you're not hitting a home run on every one. So some properties you're just going to have to offload. What ended up happening with that property? I'm assuming you still don't have it. No, I think we sold it. We sold it probably two or three years after we bought it for, I think we profited a few thousand bucks. During the time that we had it, we had a bunch of turnover and we had not the best luck with tenants. And when you're doing single family rentals, you don't have the benefit of multiple streams of income. Everything, your rent is binary. Either you have a tenant who's paying or a tenant who's not. So between the non-payment of rents and the turnover that we experienced, it wiped out most of our cash flow for each year. So by the end of it, we were just like in a position where we'd rather have the liquidity to do things locally. And at that point, I had already pivoted and started doing things in New Jersey. So it made sense for me to be a more active steward of my cash than than to kind of keep it deployed in a passive way like it was in Memphis. Yeah, you said something important. So a lot of people like single families, but the I like to say, of course, the more units, the more problems, but also the more income. <laughs> so what you're yeah. saying is if you're buying a two, three or four family and one tenant's not working out, you still have income coming in the other units. So you're fairly safe. Your tenant leaves in a single family you have no income coming in. And that can be the problem, especially with turnkey in an area that you don't know. You guys, were you trying to use local property managers at the time? Yeah, we bought it through a turnkey provider that had their own management team. And they were actually pretty good. Uh, it was mid-south home buyers. I think they're still around. We had a pretty good experience with them, all things considered. And frankly, had we held on to that property, the kind of one thesis that we did have was there were a few different sub-markets within the city that are within greater Memphis that they were buying in and the midtown submarket was where the one that we ended up purchasing was. And our thesis behind that was that it was in an area that was much more supply constrained than a lot of the other submarkets we saw because it was in a more urban environment. So there was less less available land for new development. So we felt like if the area popped and caught on among younger, trendier crowds, there was an opportunity for appreciation there. And that did pan out. We just sold out a little too early. So I think we ended up selling out for we bought it for fifty two seven. I think we sold it for like 55 and had we held on to it now, I could, I'm going to do a quick, I bet it's real like time. 190, 190. Is I don't know if guess. it's quite that high, but let me see if I'm current right. estimate is uh, just sold for 131. All right. Yeah. See, but so, that, it's so hard to hold and hold forever. I did have properties that I held for 30 years, but they were just more like family properties. I get antsy. I think you're learning your lesson with what we're going to talk about in Atlantic City on how to hold and lock down the block. But when you have a one off in an area, it's pretty easy, like with just a rando stock to just sell it and use the money for something else at some point. Yeah, I think if we were going heavier on it and planned on buying six of them or a dozen of them, it might have been a different story. But at the time, we were getting much more active in what we were doing. So it just made sense to, to deploy it in a way where we could better control the asset and better control the strategy. Yeah. Okay, let's head on over to when you started to flip, because it's always a trouble zone for definitely new investors. How did your first couple or few flips go? And what did you learn on the first couple as opposed to what you know now from all the ones, the works that you're doing now from building to renovating? What were those first few like? As I alluded to in my Memphis experience, I came into it knowing absolutely nothing. And I bought my first property in New Jersey in 2015, I believe. And I didn't start off easy. I bought a vacant and dilapidated 1890s brick row home that hadn't been occupied in 10 or 15 years. Way to make um, it hard on yourself. Yeah. So it was a full gut. I hired a GC who ultimately didn't work out. Then I hired a second GC who was marginally better, but was not nearly as experienced as he went on. And so as with most projects, even today, having done dozens of them, it cost a hell of a lot more than I expected and took a hell of a lot longer than I expected. The flip side of that was it was I had the wind at my back of being in the right place at the right time. And I think we paid 150 we paid 152.5 or something like that for the property, expecting to put $175,000 into it and selling out for 425. Mm. We ended up putting in closer to 300. I think it was 250, 275. Ended up taking two years instead of a year, but we sold it for 675 instead of 425. What so time was that, was that the, one in? 
that was in Jersey City. Oh, the first one was in Jersey City. That's a big undertaking, though, in terms of Reno. How did you finance that first one? That one was cash. I had a capital partner who put up the cash. And that was, I mean, I gave away a fair amount of the deal, but it all worked out well enough. And had I had hard money, for example, on that first deal, it would have been a much more strenuous undertaking because I would have had a huge financing gap that we had to figure out. The timing would have been an issue. It would have been a lot more pressure on the holding costs. So I sacrificed a little bit of the upside, but God, I think I, I made it easier al- along the way because I had a little more flexibility. When it was taking so long, up to two years, did it put the relationship in jeopardy? Because that's what people worry about a lot, or they don't worry about enough, in my opinion, sometimes the relationship involved in the kind of money partner aspect. Fortunately, it was indicators along the way were that demand was going to be stronger than we originally anticipated. So at every checkpoint, while we were behind schedule and over budget, the appreciation that we saw more than made up for it. Um, I think we ended up pre-selling it like before we finished construction. So as we were nearing the finish line, maybe for the last six months or so, we were under contract with a buyer already. So the exit price was predetermined and we knew that we stood to make a pretty good profit. So at that point, Say, it, was yeah. just, it was just a matter of racing to the finish line and getting to that light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, nice. And then you did a few more. How many were between that one and then the big one in South Orange before you got into the Atlantic City? Maybe a half dozen. There were two. I did two flips early on in Jersey City. Another flip that I didn't end up renovating. I just bought a off-market shell of a building and flipped it. We bought a three-family rental property there that we still own. Then I started and I migrated out between, I think between my first and second or second and third projects. I left my full-time job to jump into real estate full-time. So at that point, I needed to increase the pipeline a little bit and keep myself busy. So I broadened my horizons from just doing stuff in Jersey City to then migrating out towards Essex County, where I grew up. And in doing so, I started. I picked up a few other flips, a few rentals, and ultimately a tax lien portfolio that... I know you and I have discussed at various points in the past. So that was, definitely enough to keep that. Me, that was definitely enough to keep me busy for a while. Fast forward another few years, ended up meeting my current business partner, John. We started originally together doing construction. We started a construction business and mainly with the purposes of serving our own portfolio, started doing a little third party work, quickly realized we hated that, <laughs> transitioned to doing more property management together, and then ultimately... Uh, development together. And that's where we landed today. Eventually, those activities brought us down to Atlantic City. We started buying more, renovating more, managing more. Um, Now we do everything in-house through Liberty Hudson Capital and our affiliated businesses. And that has certainly more than kept us busy over the last few years. Yeah, yeah, definitely going to get to that. But And so just dropping back on the flip game, for new investors and like novice flippers or people looking to flip, what were maybe a couple of the biggest lessons that you learned over those first maybe four, five, six flips that could really help someone who's a little bit gung ho right now, but also gun shy? I think there, there are a lot of foundational lessons that people will teach you when you're trying to get into flipping. And one adage is for every trade, get three quotes, get three bids. And I think that's something I tried to do early on and then quickly just got overwhelmed by the amount of time that took. And the first like half decent bit I would get, I would go with because I didn't have time to meet a third contractor, a fourth contractor, a fifth contractor and chase them down for the bid. But there are a lot of things like that. Even having a super buttoned up scope of work and timeline and agreement with your contractors, all of those things are guidelines for a reason. And it's very easy as you scale up to lose sight of some of the basics like that. But there's a reason that you do all those things. And certainly for your first one, it's important to do that. But even as you scale up, as you start doing more, it's vital that you keep, that you maintain integrity around those practices. Something else that I experienced early on that I think was pivotal in my ability to grow and do more things over time was that I really dove into my first few projects. I went in knowing absolutely nothing. So I was the one who was meeting with every plumber, every electrician, every HVAC guy, every framer, every carpenter, every siding guy, roofing guy, landscaper, whoever it was. I was meeting with them, usually multiple of them, multiple ones, and I was picking their brain on every aspect of what it was that we were talking about. So by the time that I, by the time I got 
one bid, two bids, three bids on plumbing or exterior work. I was by no means an expert, but I had at least ridden that steep end of the, uh, that steep side of the learning curve. So I was able to learn fairly quickly. Definitely made some mistakes because I was green and, and didn't do all of my due diligence or put more faith in, in certain people than I should have. But yeah. I definitely learned a lot from those first few projects. Yeah, that's very common. And also, I guess it's probably more uncommon as people try to get in but not really get their hands dirty. And you did exactly what our episode seven guest Jenny Burke did. Just try to learn everything from the people who know how, including what they're doing wrong and if the bids are wrong and why. And I think that sets you up so much better for the future because now with all you're doing, you can still drop back on that experience of, oh, here's the mistakes that I made on my first view. Here's when I trusted, when I shouldn't. When you transit, what what led you to the tax lien portfolio? Because that's a really interesting one and one that you have some expertise in that I think a lot of people will want to know about. What was the first impetus to go that way? Did it seem like it was going to be more passive long-term type of stuff? So the impetus for that deal was actually, I was driving through a specific town in Essex County that I think I had already started doing. Or it was on my short list of towns that I was considering investing in. I had started looking at deals there. And I passed by maybe a 30 or 40 unit apartment building that was clearly vacant, dilapidated, the type of thing that I would love to sink my teeth into. And at the time, that type of project was probably a little far outside my breadth of expertise. But as I tend to do, I dove into it and tried to figure out who owned it, what the story was, if it was for sale, if it could be for sale. And over the course of doing that, I learned that there was a tax lien on the building. So I dug into the to the records more, traced back a few layers of entities to figure out who owned the tax lien, found an email address for someone there, reached out to them, and they started telling me a little bit more about the building. They told me that the tax lien had been redeemed, so they no longer had an interest in the property. But they also told me that they owned, I think, hundreds of other tax liens in that same city. And they said that obviously I knew that, which was complete news to me. So we started talking more and more about that. They mentioned that they had this subset of their portfolio that they were looking to offload because it didn't align with the timeline of their fund and they wanted to accelerate their exit. It so happened that was like the tail end of their portfolio with a few liens that were more ripe for foreclosure in tax lien. In let, me, let me stop you for one second because I have one point sure. and then I want to get a, like a background on what the stuff is before we finish the tax lien. But the biggest point for any listener who's brand new is you did all of that due diligence not knowing anything by just driving by a property and then you bumped into someone who owns hundreds of tax liens. You know, because I think like investors are always wondering like, how do I get started? What do I do? You can just start driving for dollars. That's really what you were doing. And then you you're just doing the due diligence and research yourself, right? Yeah. Sometimes it's worth taking action even when you don't know what the end is. Um, and right. Action really doesn't have to be that. spending the money. You're trying to do the, but you did the research to get yourself in a position where this major deal ended up happening. And then before right. we finish, though, can you just explain? I know the answers <laughs> to this, or I wouldn't ask, what are our tax liens? And what does it mean when they've been redeemed? Because I think that's the most important part. Everyone's interested, but it's a little bit complicated for a novice or even someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, so I'll speak to it mostly from a New Jersey standpoint. They're governed very differently in, right. in each state. But for New Jersey, so easiest way to think about it, a tax lien certificate is that it's a debt. It's akin to a mortgage, a slightly different class of debt. But think of it like a mortgage. So every taxpayer has a duty to pay their property taxes to the municipality. Uh, the municipality then uses those tax dollars to fund things like schools and police and fire departments and public services and all sorts of things. Um, obviously, the lion's share of any town's budget comes from its property tax revenue. So keeping that revenue consistent is a vital part in the stability of any municipality. So in order to do that, if there are residents who are not paying their property taxes, they have the right to auction off the auction off the right to that debt, essentially. So they hold an auction, the mechanics of which I, I won't dive into, but you can find <laughs> more resources out there if you're curious. And essentially the outcome of that is that an investor comes in and says, I will front the money for this person's debt in exchange for a certain rate of return. 
And so if you owe $10,000 in property taxes, they would agree to pay the $10,000. And in order to secure the debt, in order to guarantee that the investor will be repaid, that tax sale certificate is filed on, on title with the county as a tax lien, as a tax lien. So that lien ultimately needs to be redeemed in order for the property owner to get a mortgage or sell the property or have clean title in any way. So the kind of like security of that position is that there are really two outcomes. One is that your lien is redeemed. Second, which means the debt has been paid off. The second is that if after a certain period of time, as the tax lien holder, you have the right to file foreclosure on the property. And if during that 12 month or more period, they still do not pay off the lien or sell the property or whatever, then you ultimately take title to the property. So that ended up being the outcome on, I think about half of the liens that we purchased in that portfolio. So we ended up having about, I think we bought 23 liens in this portfolio. About half of them were redeemed and about half of them we went to foreclosure on and ultimately received the asset in, in return. Yeah. So when they get and redeemed, then either renovated, yeah. And then either renovated the buildings or sold them off as is. When they get redeemed, you get your money back plus the interest that you've banked in the meantime. So that's okay. just a win-win. You parked your money for a little bit in hopes that maybe you get a good property, but if not, you get a good return. So then when you ended up with this half 11 or 12 properties, you had to decide which ones to flip, which ones to wholesale, which ones to just jettison and sale. How did you go through and decide on those what to do? And then tell us about just a couple of the disasters that ensued on those flips. The numbers were good, but the town was tough on you. Yeah. In hindsight, uh, so I think the initial goal was to renovate as many of them as possible. We ended up getting more properties back through foreclosure than we expected and didn't have the cash to renovate all of them at once. So very quickly became a situation where we were either going to sit on it for a little while until we sold off another property and freed up the cash to renovate, or we could just sell them as is. I think of the 11 or so that we got back, we ended up renovating... I think we ended up renovating four of them. There were a few others that we cleaned out, demoed, and did some very minor stuff to and then sold off. But I think about seven of them we just sold off without doing much work to. And those on a cash basis, those were probably at least as profitable or about as profitable as the ones that we spent a year plus renovating. But certainly from a from the perspective of best use of our time and like easiest path towards a return, the ones that we sold immediately were the by far the way to go. Yeah. There is some value in wholesaling if you get the properties the right way. Right. Yeah. I mean we were I guess you would say oh, the strategy that we ended up employing on those was probably most similar to wholesaling because we actually yeah. had title to the property. We were right, uh, right, right. Yeah, most of them Sorry. we held for a few months. A few of them we, a few of them there were buyers who backed out. Again, we reaped the benefits of being in the right place at the right time. We were we started this process in an ascending market, and so I think some of the exits that we ended up seeing were quite a bit above what we anticipated. And obviously that windfall is great for returns for me and for our investors. Yeah, I much prefer wholesaling, but obviously you have to have the money or the leverage to get them into the wholesale situation. For anyone who doesn't know wholesaling is, you're going to buy it, own it, usually clean it up, put some lipstick on it, and then sell it quickly on the market or off market, depending on who you find. But I find that's just a more structured thing than trying to do the wholesale and the spread in between. And it's a little bit murkier that way. You don't have to really tell somebody that you're assigning the contract when you wholesale. So much right. easier. Let's jump over to what you and John are doing now, Atlantic City, because it went crazy. I remember when you first started talking about Atlantic City, and then the next thing you know, it has mushroomed. How many units do you guys have in Atlantic City now? I honestly don't know the answer to that offhand. <laughs> it's um, a lot. Probably. <laughs> it's dozens. I don't know quite how many. We're actually closing on a 48-unit condo hotel on Tuesday, I believe. 48 um, so units? Will, 48 units. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, that's going to be that's gonna be a pretty big project for us, for sure. We what's, have the a, end, what's the end game on that? Are you staying a hotel or you go into something yeah, modified? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of a perfect property for short-term rentals because it has the land use designation of a hotel. It also 
it was original. It's I think maybe 30, 40 years old, and it was originally built as condos. It has separate, separate utilities. It it That's was huge. built to have a kitchenette in each unit, and then each of the units are deeded separately. So if and when we go to exit the building 10, 15, 20 years down the line, whenever it ends up being, we have that sort of exit strategy already accelerated. So we're going to operate them as short-term rentals, mostly Airbnb. We'll have various varied distribution, but primarily Airbnb. We have, in the meantime, though, 48 units to renovate. I think it's about 30,000 square feet, plus rooftop, like a rooftop common area. There's like a three-story parking garage, like a to the side and beneath the building and then lobby and some other common space. So definitely the biggest thing that we've done to date, it's probably on par with the total of everything we've done over the last few years. So <laughs> right. it'll be a lot, but I think we'll, we'll manage to get it done one way or one way or another. Yeah. So let's talk about Atlantic city a little, because people have, I guess, a misperception about it, especially given what I know that you guys have found there. How did you get into Atlantic city? And of course you and John have a podcast episode on your podcast, uh, brick, I call it brick by brick, but it, is that what you call it? Or is yeah. it brick? Yeah, yeah, it's brick by brick. Brick by brick, uh, the brick, case, ex, brick, yeah, brick, but yeah. right. The case brick. for Atlantic City. If you're interested, you should listen to that episode of Ryan and John's podcast. It will tell you. We'll do the short version now. How did you guys end up focusing on Atlantic City, and why is it such a hot commodity for you right now? So there are a few kind of a few driving forces behind our thesis. I grew up in New Jersey, so I had been to Atlantic City growing up, and through my college years as a consumer, but I didn't really know much about it outside of the casinos. And my business partner, John, had invested in a deal, I want to say in 2017 or so, with a few of his friends. And they bought a single family. They were renting it out on Airbnb. It was doing quite well. At the time, John and I were doing stuff in North Jersey and we're looking for something a little different. So we started going down to Atlantic City and looking for stuff there. We ended up picking up a few properties that were just completely gutted or needed to be completely gutted. And we had the idea to renovate them, like purpose build them for short term rentals. And then as we started doing that, we became more and more consumed with the idea of what Atlantic City could be. Obviously spending time down there for our projects, we got to know the city much better outside of just the casinos. And we started formulating this thesis that has now become the basis for most of our investing there. There are a few things that, obviously, it's a city that has its share of problems, and those are well-documented. But it also has a lot of things that are that are unique to Atlantic City and that present a one-of-a-kind opportunity. One is, first and foremost, obviously, the coastal location and the proximity to the beach. If you're familiar with the Mid-Atlantic, with New York, New Jersey, uh, you know how expensive beachfront real estate can be. and relative to almost any other beach town within two hours of New York or Philadelphia or DC, the prices there are unparalleled. Um, it's crazy. I that, think I remember you saying at one point, where else can you buy beachfront real estate for $50,000, which is what you guys were buying it for. And that's held true over the whole course of time. Yeah. our One of our bigger projects that, we've, that we did there is beach block. It's maybe 100 feet from the beach or 100 feet from the boardwalk in a quiet part of town. And we picked up the building for 150 grand, renovated it within the existing building envelope. Granted, we put a lot of money into it, but yeah. it's now a seven bedroom, four and a half bath, single family home that steps from the beach with views and fully renovated and all this stuff. And we're all in in the fives in any other beach town to have something of that size with that proximity to the beach. You're it's looking like at over $2, two million. million dollars. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank That's you. one of your many Airbnbs, right? I know we'll get into the pricing and what you've learned about Airbnb. But yeah, how did you scale out to what I call clustering, which we've talked about a lot in terms of just buying up as much on all the blocks there as you could? So as we started formulating this thesis and really became committed to what we wanted to do there, we started, we formed an opportunity zone fund and started raising money through that, contributed some of our own cash from sales of other property. And we ended up committing to deploying it primarily in Atlantic City. Ultimately, that ended up being deploying it exclusively in Atlantic City. And all of that kind of coalesced in a way that really made it a prime candidate for what 
your the strategy that you've coined clustering. So what we've been doing is we're limited in what we can buy based on the types of projects that can be qualified opportunity zone projects. So we it has to be something that's distressed that we can put a lot of money into and it has to be within a certain geographic within right. a certain geographic bounds. So even a lot of Atlantic City is an opportunity zone, which is fortunate for us, but not all of Atlantic City is, a, is an opportunity zone. So by virtue of that and the amount of money that we had to deploy in a pretty concentrated area, we almost had to cluster by nature. Right. So there are a few areas that we really went have gone pretty hard on. There are three separate little, like three separate blocks or like series of blocks in town where we have a pretty substantial presence. And a lot of the thesis is that everything we do helps the other stuff that we're doing. So on one block, for example, we own, I think, four separate buildings and five lots, five vacant lots that we ultimately hope to build on. And that for the first one we bought, we had plans to renovate and ultimately turn into a short-term rental. The second one, kind of same idea. And then the third one came up and it was priced a little more than we wanted, but we figured we already have this other stuff. And more than anything, we want to control the block and make sure that it's, these properties are getting into the hands of people who are going to be good custodians of the building and of what we want to see in that area. Same thing happened the fourth time. And all the while, we're like resetting comps. Or, exactly. You know, favor, I mean, that's the magic. Or something. That's the magic of clustering. The whole point is if you over... So clustering in general for listeners is buying a bunch of properties yourself or with a partner or with friends all in the same general vicinity, because then it gives you scale, what Ryan was just saying on your appraisal values. So if you buy in high on one, you're only helping your other values. And it's not market fixing or anything like that. You're just buying real estate. The more you have in one area, the more it helps you because say you have five properties on one block, like Ryan said, you flip two, you keep two. And then when you sell the two flips, you just increase the potential on the other two holds. And then you can refi out at those higher appraisal values that you just sold and then take the money out and do it all again. You guys have been doing this. I mean, you have a lot of properties in Atlantic City, but you raised a good point. And I want to do drop back on the opportunity zone as well. Even when you're buying blocks away, you're still driving, I guess, the upward scale of the neighborhood. And you can be pushing a couple blocks away just to say, this is what we want to move the neighborhood. Can you just explain the opportunity zone? What are the benefits to it and how has it helped you? I know you have to hold it longer and there are certain tax benefits. How is it helping you and why is that such an attractive option? Yeah, so the opportunity zone program, I think, was initially passed in 2017 or 2018. And we actually looked at it in its early days and felt like it wasn't the best fit for what we were doing because we thought it was going to be better suited to projects that were much larger. A few years later, we revisited it and came to a different conclusion. But the idea is that if you have a qualified gain, which is generally a capital gain, it can be from real estate, it can be from the sale of stocks, it can be from the sale of business, If you have a qualified gain, you can invest that in either an opportunity zone fund or an opportunity zone business or property and realize certain tax benefits. So the first benefit is that you have a deferral on your capital gains tax. So if you sell property in 2021, you have to pay taxes on that gain for your with your tax returns for tax year 2021. If you invest that money, if you elect to invest that money in an opportunity zone fund or business, you can defer that gain through tax year 2026. So you can put that money that otherwise would have gone to Uncle Sam in 2021. You can put that into an investment and generate some type of return over the subsequent four or five years until that tax bill is due. And then in an ideal world, the cash that you were able to deploy for those five or six years that you didn't pay in taxes generates enough income or a high enough return in those four or five years that you just created more income that can become the cash you use to pay that tax return. That's one. So that's one benefit of it. There's a second benefit that's more minor, which is yeah. after a certain period of time, if the timing works out correctly, I don't know if this Perk is even still available if you just invest in an opportunity zone fund today. But if enough time elapses between when you elect 
your investment in an opportunity zone fund and when your tax liability is due in 2026, you can actually realize a slight decrease in what that tax burden is, which is just another nice little cherry on top. And then the third benefit, which is, I would argue, the largest benefit is... If you invest in uh, in an opportunity zone business or property and hold that property for 10 years or longer, when you go to sell the property, your basis in the investment is marked up to fair market value. So in theory... Reduces your overall you, profit then. Taxes, the opposite. I mean. Well, for tax purposes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so in, in an ideal world, you can buy property, hold it for 10 or 15 years. And if that property that you invest in after 10 or 15 years generates a capital gain of $200,000, $500,000, $3 million, you can mark your investment, your cost basis in that investment up to fair market value. So when you go to sell it, you have no capital gain burden. So for a lot of investors, that's really, I think, the, the driving motivation. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's hop over to Airbnbs and then we'll get to our questions to wrap up. How many short term rentals do you guys have in Atlantic City about right now? You actually probably know this one. I think our total is right around 30 split right now between North Jersey and Atlantic City. We have another probably 25 or so listings in some state of renovation right now. And then we have this 48 unit building. That's going to be another 48 listings, uh, maybe more, depending on how we um, do that. Uh, you're going them. very close to the Century Club there. <laughs> yeah. And then there's some other, there are a few other projects in our pipeline, mostly with land that we own that would could be another eight units, another 16 units, another 24 units, at least some of which would be short term rentals. I think we're getting to the point where we're starting to starting to take a hybrid view of a lot of these projects and to do new construction and to do 100% short-term rentals is a little bit of a risky proposition. So for some of these, we're thinking maybe we build 20 units and four of them or eight of them or 10 of them are short-term rentals and the other half are long-term rentals. But it all kind of furthers the vision of enhancing the area in which we operate. And yeah, you know, it also goes back to what we said at the beginning. Those are two different options. And we said one, two, three, four, you have leverage. If you have a 48 unit and 24 short term, 24 long term, at least they have the 24 long term in case there's some anomaly with uh, Airbnb. Let's just talk about maybe your top three things you've learned about doing so many short term rentals, because we've always talked about them, but I'm sure there's three that will come to mind pretty quickly. Just for people who are looking to get into short term rentals, what are like the three things that you would tell them? You need to know this is what I learned because you're operating so many and it is a it's a fast paced business. Reviews are really important. Upkeep is extremely important. Hit us with a generally your top three, and then we'll get into our final questions. I'm putting me on the spot here. All right. Yeah. Um, well, I know from our conversations, one, some of them. Yeah. The first one I'd say is that pricing is key. There, are, if you forecast that a given property is going to generate five thousand dollars a month in in revenue, you can achieve that in very different ways. You could have you could price it at one hundred seventy dollars a night and have one hundred percent occupancy, and that brings you to right around five thousand dollars a month. You could also price it at three hundred fifty dollars a night and have fifty percent occupancy, and that brings you to the same five thousand dollars a month in revenue. Different markets, I think, call for different strategies. In Atlantic City, I think we've done a little bit more of the latter because we don't want someone who's someone who's kind of bargain shopping on a short-term rental can be a recipe for disaster. And yep. the moment you have a nightmare guest who paid so little that you, in hindsight, shouldn't have rented it to them in the first place anyway, because it wasn't worth your time. The moment yeah. you have an issue with them, you're going to regret it. It's also it's less wear and tear on the properties. It's less taxing on your operations team, your cleaners, your maintenance people, property manager. So I'd say definitely pay attention to pricing and understand how pricing fits into what your overall strategy is. I think, Second I thing, mean, you, you talked okay. about number two. Let's just do it. It's always cleaning, right? <laughs> I was just going to hit yeah, you with that one. Sure. Yeah. Tell yeah, us why we, it's so important off, on the changeover because it's just, it's insanely important. And if people don't understand to get an important, have the cleaners in place and like really trust them, you're going to get all bad reviews. Yeah. It's like what people say with construction. There's, 
the quality of the cleaning, there's the cost of the cleaning, and then there's the reliability of the cleaner. The cost of the cleaning was something that we were more focused on when we first started. And I remember getting some quotes for cleaning that I thought were crazy, just having lived in houses and apartments in my, yeah. over, my over the course of my life. Like the prices that people were quoting for what were going to be like regular frequent cleanings seemed very high to me. My tune on that has changed a little bit if I can get the second and third components down. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's cost, there's quality of the cleaning. If you don't have a clean place, whether someone's paying a lot or a little, that's probably like the foundational expectation that any guest has. They just want yeah. a clean place to stay. We usually use white linens at our properties so people can very easily tell whether the sheets and towels are clean or dirty. That's usually indicative of the condition of the place as a whole. So yeah. definitely don't skimp on that. And I would say also make sure you are following up and auditing that because it's very easy for someone to do a really good job cleaning once. But if someone's cleaning twice a week, you want to make sure that they're maintaining that same quality every time. So definitely pop in and check in on how that's going. And then the third thing is reliability. As you scale, and even with one property, you cannot afford to have a cleaner miss a cleaning. But certainly as you have 5, 10, 20, 30 listings, the importance of that is amplified. There's nothing worse than a guest coming in to a property that they just paid several thousand dollars for to find that it hasn't been clean and looks and smells. That's really hard to recover from. Yeah. So the second tip, which was really three, three separate tips. Yeah. I think we got them all. About cleaning and operations. And then third one I have is this is something that we've, I've learned, I think more recently focus on quality assets, quality listings. We have a few, we've had a few in our portfolio over the years that we put on just because it was convenient and because it made sense. And we didn't invest in them like we yeah. should have in hindsight. It's much more enjoyable to operate a property that people enjoy staying at. It just it gets really taxing to worry every time someone checks in that they're not going to be happy with the house. They're not going to be happy with the area. They might feel that something was misleading or whatever. There are so many ways that you can, for not a lot of money, enhance the experience and increase the quality of your listing. And that over time, that will pay dividends. So I would... Highly encourage that. I'd much rather have one really strong listing than three really crappy ones that make more money. Yeah, because it's going to drastically reduce the amount of calls that you get. And for somebody or anybody, if you want to do multiple and get scale on any business like that, you have to, the properties have to be managed correctly so you don't have intake all the time and all the issues. Like you said, if you have a kind of bad property, you're going to be waiting for the shoe to drop. And then you're always going to be spending your time on that instead of finding new properties or working on the better ones. Those are three great tips. And with all of the short term rentals that you have, I'm sure you're learning new stuff all the time as well. Let's get into our questions. I have your answers. So I'm going to say the question tell you what you answered and then ask you why. <laughs> this was an interesting one to me though. Your greatest influence in real estate, Jay Scott, who wrote the book on flipping houses for bigger pockets. How did you come up with Jay Scott as your biggest influence? Was that one of the first books you read or did you get connect with him at some point? Yeah, I connected with him really early on. It was actually before he started doing real estate investing and before I had started doing real estate investing. There's a little bit of a personal connection there. But by the time I started going heavier into these renovation projects. I think he had released his, he had a blog and then he had released his book. And in particular, he had his book on estimating rehab costs and yeah. I'm definitely a numbers guy. And the way that he explained each different trade and each different line item that you would see in a construction that spoke budget to you. I know your personality. Of, yeah, made a lot of sense to me. <laughs> so <laughs> that it was like a, it was a really good primer on construction in general and marrying the, concept of what has to be done with what it should cost and how someone's going to price it out. So I, I think after reading that and referencing it over the years, that really allowed me to speak with a little bit more authority or just it taught me the lingo that I didn't know and probably allowed me to come across as less dumb than I really was. <laughs> I wonder if you'll agree. This is what I always say about those two books. I love both books, the book on estimating rehab costs and the book on flipping houses. What I always tell people is disregard the actual monetary amounts and focus on all the line items that he talks about. Because the monetary amounts could change in any area, but what you're getting is basically a literally a workflow of everything not to forget. And then you're going to continually be assigning your own costs to that. Do you agree, you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. He also, I think he 
in the spirit of that, he actually, I think, re, re-released an updated version with more accurate costs. But yeah, it's great for two things. One is understanding what it is that you're going to be looking at. And for each item that you're looking at, understanding how a subcontractor is going to price that work. So you can then compare apples to apples across different guys. Great. Hopefully I'll get him on the show as well. Next one up is what the most important trait for a real estate investor to have. You said, I love this. This is in my wheelhouse too. You said a long-term lens. Why is it so important to have that long-term thinking as a real estate investor, especially a new one? I think this kind of, this is informed a lot by my growing disdain for flipping. (laughs) So (laughs) with flipping, you're looking at a, you're looking at a binary outcome. You're either going to make money or you're not. Generally, when you're buying a rental property, you should over enough time, if you haven't horrifically screwed up your purchase, you should make money. It's just a matter of how much. Um, and you just give yourself so much more breathing room if you're looking at how much, uh, how an inve- how a long term investment is going to perform over 10 or 15 or 20 years versus trying to take the shortcut approach to wealth and saying, I'm going to buy this today. And in six months, it's going to be worth $200,000 more. And I'm going to be able to pull out all my cash and recycle it into something again, or just sell the property and make $200,000. That's great if you can execute on that. And I've done it. And there are plenty of people who have as well. But banking on being able to do that every single time, you're flirting with disaster. And yeah, don't, so don't over- Sorry, don't you think that, yeah, right along this line, I think people are trying to hit the home run first and they're less right. concerned with just knocking out a couple singles here over time. That's the that's it. Sorry to interrupt you. Finish off what you were saying as well. That was the just <laughs> point. I think time is a huge hedge on risk in real estate. And you explained you it with your... Hold, yeah, if you, if you can manage to hold a property for 15, 20, 30 years and not lose it to a bank, then you're probably going to end up doing pretty well. Yeah, and you explained it with your first investment in Memphis. If you still had it, now it'd be at one thirty right. from fifty-seven. <laughs> so there it is, right there. Rub what it is, in, why don't you? <laughs> I, I, you've done many other projects. What is wrong with the real estate investing world right now? This is an interesting one. Investors underestimate the significance of macro activities like low interest rates and QE. What's QA, and what do you mean by the macro activities? Because I know you are a macro activity guy. Yeah, it's funny. I don't always heed my own advice on this. I think I don't remember when I filled that out, but I think that the last few months that has this has just proven more and more true. I guess the, the two things I mentioned were interest rates and qualitative easing. Really, what it comes down to is like how the capital markets influence the real estate markets, and I think it's it's fairly topical these days to see some kind of chart that shows like a year or two ago when interest rates were two and three quarters points versus today at six points, what the impact is on someone's mortgage payment. And I think there's no other way to slice it other than that the way that things have trended over the last six months or so yeah. do not bode particularly well for the real estate market. That doesn't mean it's going to implode. But even if you just price in what somebody can afford based on the increase in their payment due to the rise in interest rates, there's... Like that there is a significant dent in property values. There are plenty of other macroeconomic factors that play into that as well. The quantitative easing component is simply really just how much cash is there out there that's looking for a place to go, a place to be parked. Yeah. And that the more money there is in the economy, the more each of these different asset classes are effectively subsidized by the amount of money chasing them. So I don't think the capital markets probably will not dry up completely. That seems like a pretty doomsday scenario for me. But the lack of money out there these days relative to a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, certainly has an impact on investor appetite and whether that's for investors to buy property or for investors to buy the loans that ultimately are issued on property that all plays into the overall puzzle. Awesome. Here we go. One way we could all collectively make the real estate investing world better. You said build better products, i.e. buildings. That's really what you're doing. Don't skimp on this stuff, right? Yeah. And this is, again, a lesson I learned from doing the opposite for a little while. The first few renovations I did 
not all of them, but several of them. I, I had a budget. I had a budget from either a lender or that I had shown to partners. And that was the budget I had to stick with. And there was only so much I could do within that budget. But now, because it's a little bit more in sync with our investing thesis, we first and foremost try to build nice stuff. And because we're doing short-term rentals and ultimately going to get outsized or get a substantial increase in revenue because we have better product, we can justify that. But even for the long-term rentals that I hold, that I've had over the years, that I've renovated at various points in time, I generally look back and wish I had done more. I wish I had put in the central AC or I wish that I had reconfigured the layout to be more optimal from the get-go. And I wish that I had... I wish that I had re-sheetrocked or yeah. put in new molding or whatever. They're just every aspect of it. Like, There's always a way to spend more money. There's always a way to, to go more overboard. But I think people have a tendency to just go in and do the absolute cheapest thing possible. And yes. I would advocate us all to do better because it leads to... I think it ultimately drives better returns over the long haul. It also creates a better environment for somebody to live in and particularly with exterior work, it enhances the neighborhood in which you are an investor. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think that it makes it hard for those of us who are conscious flippers to have all the bad flippers out there making our job harder. I feel like people are coming in with an extra hard lens on flipping now. And I'm like, no, I do everything. And then they're picking off like ridiculous things that no one, why didn't you tile the utility room? <laughs> the utility room can be like now how much do you want me to do they make it harder for us all right just wrapping up. Utility room, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah you're fancy you're fancy man we're gonna wrap it up with this it. yeah if you had one piece of advice for new real estate investors out there to maintain a more mindful approach to real estate what would it be you've learned a lot over the last 10 years just doing all of these projects and you've had a lot of volume What's one piece of mindful advice that you could relay from your experience that would help somebody on their real estate investing journey? I think it's important. It's definitely important to think about the literal nuts and bolts of real estate and construction. But I think it's also really important to think from the top down, what is it that is driving you to invest in real estate? For some people, it's a passion for buildings. For some, it's the desire to achieve financial independence over 20 or 30 or 40 years. There are probably some people who want to make a quick buck and just get out of it or spend it or whatever. But I think for most people, if there's a grander vision at play, something more long term. And I think if you can think through that lens when you're approaching your flip or approaching a renovation on a rental property, you might make, you, you should make better decisions on where you spend your money. And when things go awry, it's a little easier to swallow because you understand the greater purpose of what you're doing and you're not... So what, a tenant missed a few months rent and you have to evict them or come to some sort of agreement with them to rectify the situation. That sucks. And you've probably lost several thousand dollars and time and aggravation. But that over a 20 or 30 year time horizon should be a drop in the bucket. And I think helping framing it from that perspective, I think makes some of the day-to-day the -day burden of being in real estate a little more easy to swallow. Yeah, and that's really about the why are you doing it? And it's okay if money is involved in there, but anything I think where money is the guiding principle, it's always going to just drive you off the track a little bit. All Absolutely. right, my friend, it was great to have you on. If there's listeners out there who don't know you and they want to get in touch with you, where is the best place to get in touch with you? Uh, you can email me, ryan at libertyhudson.com. You can visit our website, which I believe is libertyhudson.com for Liberty Hudson Capital, libertyhudsonsolutions.com for our property management company. And you can, we haven't been great about recording episodes recently, but we do have a podcast that Jonathan alluded to earlier. It's the Brick by Brick podcast, Brick X Brick on iTunes or the podcast app, Spotify, wherever you listen to your podcasts everywhere and i've been on that i really enjoy it and if you want to learn about atlantic city there's one really great one and then there's a follow-up on it there's good guests there as well and as ryan knows i'm going to do this before we get out of here listen if you like podcasts and you're listening to my podcast or ryan podcast what would help us all is if you actually like it 
is if you set up your thing so you're going to follow the podcast, you write a five-star review if you like it. But I don't think any of us really want to beg for that type of stuff. If you find that it's a value, share it with your friends because real estate investing is tough. There's a million podcasts out there. I can tell you from listening to a lot of them, a lot of those people don't have the experience. So you want to focus on people who are in the trenches doing the work and not trying to sell you a 50-week class for $50,000, which neither of us have available at the current time. That's it. So if you do it, that would be great for us both. Please go and listen to Ryan's podcast, Brick by Brick, and follow along as he takes over Atlantic City. Ryan, thanks so much for having me on. Actually, I had you on. I think thank I'm you just, so much for having yeah. me on. <laughs> thank you, sir. Now, it's always a pleasure, uh, and I look forward to seeing what happens next in Atlantic City. Thanks, man. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks. Thanks.